Good morning and welcome to our very first live stream of Cannon Hills Presbyterian Church's Sunday morning worship. We are glad that you are joining us this morning. Um, you will see us all trying to do our very best in a new medium today. I was grateful for our band to jam us in this morning. You are invited this morning also if you are following with us on Facebook Live to participate with us. Matt Moncrief will be our e-liturgist this morning. He is serving in that capacity by capturing and responding to your postings. And if you have a prayer request, please be sure that you put that in the posting or comments and we will capture those as well to be included later in our prayers of the community. Our other leaders this morning include Vanessa Bates and Jody O'Donnell as our worship leaders as they lead our prayers and responses. We also have our music leadership here, Leslie Berger and Lee Massey and Craig Coy, Bill Berger and the members of Godsend, uh, Andrea, Roger, Steve, Dave, Dave, oh, so many Dave. <sighs> so we are very glad today to begin worship together. So with that, I'm going to introduce Jody O'Donnell to bring us in with our call to worship. Good morning. Let us join together in our call to worship, which, which comes today from Psalm 95. O oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us Let's come, come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O oh come, let us worship and bow down, and let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For, For he is our God, God and, and we are his people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand.
Thank you so much. I am glad that we have so many uh, medical professionals in our congregation, and we wanted to invite a couple that will offer some words of comfort and confidence. So I'd love to invite um, Dr. Vicki Shook Connery and Dr. Rick McGuire to come and join me up here. We're going to practice safe social distancing, so I'm going to ask you two to stand sort of over there, but, you know. Wait for you. Wait for me. Yeah, there we go. So we are so glad to have you here this morning. Are we all in Harbor Good? Um, that, so that we can just have a conversation so our members of our congregation can feel kind of at ease as we kind of go through this whole period of time together. Um, so we've all probably seen, especially the two of you, the anxiety that has been created over the COVID-19 virus. Um, and so we're feeling that in our community, we're feeling it nationally, we're feeling it globally. Um, and a lot of that is because the risks still are somewhat unknown and there's misinformation that gets out there about the virus and how it can spread. So we know about hand washing, we know about social distancing, but what hasn't been talked about a lot is um, self-care for yourself and when to know when to self-isolate or quarantine when we need to go get tested and all of that. So I just wanted to have kind of a brief conversation with both of you. Um, you know about the virus, how it's progression, and so I think that you could share some advice with us. So first of all, what should you do if, what kind of self-care things can you do if you come down with flu-like symptoms, which I know are similar to the COVID virus symptoms as well. So what would you suggest? Um, I, I tell my patients that uh, those who have colds or coughs or just feel under the weather, first of all, stay at home. There's no reason necessarily to require medical care. Uh, you can treat yourself with the usual things with Tylenol and with things for cough and so on that you can receive. If you think that you have a virus or the flu, that reasonable to, to be at home and be away from other people as we're all doing anyway. The times are different when people are sicker, when they're feeling problems with fevers that are high, problems with really uh, breathing issues. But that becomes a different story and a time perhaps to seek uh, ER attention. We'll talk about that as well. But when you're, when you're otherwise at home, uh, the things you can do. Uh, at our office, we're actually calling people a day before and to confirm their, their, their scheduled dates. If they have cough and fever at all, we say stay home and we give suggestions about the next steps for them. Uh, those who come into our office with those as a day screen, we're actually putting aside uh, evaluating them and making a decision. You go home today, take care of yourself, or if you're sicker, we make the recommendations to the transfer uh, to the emergency room for their evaluation. Uh, and we prepare them so the ER is prepared to know somebody's coming in for possible uh, coronavirus exposure. Um, for those who go home, my suggestion uh, is uh, with the self quarantine uh, for the 14 day recommendation, uh, you're not alone. A few things, you know, don't panic. Uh, the things that can be done from use of uh, telephones, people talking to uh, you on FaceTime, other kind of things that you can be able at least to uh, uh, feel as though you're not alone. And emotional health. So, you know, uh, don't panic as I say, but turn the TV off when it comes to watching all this information with the news all the time. Uh, do things like, uh, remain healthy with exercise and good eating and sleep and also uh, take it as an opportunity to do things around the house where there may be closer to the mic thank you where there may be an issue of uh, 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 cleaning the house uh, cleaning the garage doing something that you would never otherwise not have done maybe this is an opportunity to may have been lost uh, otherwise are being out um, the ways of doing it the biggest thing is to realize you're not alone you have family friends and church and there's ways of communicating so you know, keep that in mind too. Uh, questions about things like the ER and when they go to the ER, like some can help me handle. Well, um, you will be screened when you present to the emergency room, and you'll be screened before you hit the waiting room. If you have symptoms that need to be addressed um, that are COVID-like, then someone will probably come out to see you. You don't want people in the waiting room, um, and. Uh, the changes that have come so far are that if you come into the emergency room, one person only, we, we are not equipped to handle whole families, 
So don't bring your entire family with you. We don't want them exposed, and we don't have a place for them, okay? Um, oftentimes, you will be seen and sent home. If you have simple symptoms, and you just have flu-like symptoms, you're breathing fine, don't even come to the emergency room. Do as Rick has suggested, and take care of yourself at home. We are trying to limit exposure between people and between the patients that come in and all of our staff in the ER. Um, we need to be healthy to treat you, so, and we don't want our medical system to be overwhelmed, so if you are just having simple symptoms, please stay at home, okay? That's what we're thinking about testing, because people are very concerned. Some people will be tested just to make sure they're okay at that moment in time. Some have reason to be tested, but we are limited. Uh, doctor's offices do not have the test kits. So to go to be tested alone is not a reason for the visit. Even the emergency room, I understand, is limited yeah. within every day. Yes, we, even our large hospital, we only have 20 test kits from the CDC. So people that come and show up and go, I want to be tested for this, we're sorry, you don't have the test, and you've exposed yourself to a lot of sick people. So please don't do that. So we're going to hope for more tests yeah. soon. Mm -hmm. um, so the last thing is, if let's say someone comes down with symptoms and they're, they decide they're going to do a responsible thing, self-isolate, that doesn't mean that you have to be alone all the time, right? So those who are helping care for you need to follow the hand washing, the safe distancing, and all of that, but you don't have to be alone. There are others who can care for you, make meals for you, and all of that. So what we need to be mindful of are those that we might know who live alone and are having to be self-isolated so we can come and help them through this process. Great. All right. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Vicki and Rich. We really appreciate that. So let us gather together in our prayer of confession. And for those who are new to our um, our uh, worship style. Um, so there will be an introductory prayer and then we have a moment of silence for individual prayer. And then we'll okay. As we bow down before you, Lord, we acknowledge that we don't that we don't know. We are living in the unknown and we are way beyond the familiar and comfortable. Instead of turning toward you and holding tight to your promises, we instead welcome fear and uncertainty. Hear us as we lift our hearts and prayers to you. Help us, help us in our unbelief, and help us see our circumstances through your perspective. May we be your choice of the day we are entering. May we resist much needed Sabbath, so that our bodies and minds might become still and know that you are God. Help us to get into you and to your grace, living God. Instead of reaching with our hands, help us reach out with our hearts to share the compassion of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the neighbors. May we sing and pray when we want to run and hide. May we serve and love and when we want to work and lay away. May we share the riches of healing. Now is the time of salvation. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven and are called to share grace and comfort.
scripture lesson this morning comes to us from Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Let us hear the word of God together. He, being Jesus, then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers, and he went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect them from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a new way to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Later, they, and they being the Jewish leaders among the crowds, later they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You are not swayed by popular opinion because you pay no attention to who is saying it, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is on this? And whose inscription is stamped upon it? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God. And they were amazed at him. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, I know that you have blessed our efforts this day. Help us to hear your comfort and confidence this day through your word and through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This week, I cannot help but in admit that the information that has been coming at us so quickly has been hard to process. It's been hard to process everything. It felt like the moment that we made a decision about a direction to go, there would be new news, new information about the outbreak of this virus that could be life-threatening to some and 
that it presented a challenge for us because we needed to then change or pivot directions and add to the response. I had to take in information that was given to us by government leaders and recommendations by religious leaders all at the same time and somehow reach a conclusion about how to respond to this challenge. And sometimes I found the recommendations outside of our own church community were in conflict. What is a faithful believer to do when it feels like our sacred traditions are being challenged for the health and the well-being of the community? That's where I was stuck. What is a faithful believer to do when it feels like our sacred traditions are being challenged for the health and the well-being of the community? It felt like this was a test of sorts. Is the extreme response to the effects of the virus just another way to undercut church in America, to destroy what little we feel like we have left? If I refrain, refrain from gathered worship and other church events, am I abandoning faith? Questions started popping up in all kinds of discussions. Should we remain faithful to our traditions of gathered worship, ignoring the risks of how and show a faithful solidarity and trust in God? As we were becoming more and more physically isolated, decisions needed to be made in community for the community. The irony was thick. It all felt like a test, like a trap. Jesus was not a stranger to traps. His opponents worked hard at posing creative questions that seemed to have no right answer, but plenty of wrong answers. He was often confronted with the damned if you do, damned if you don't type of questions. And that is exactly where we find Jesus in our scripture lesson this morning. Jesus had journeyed to Jerusalem. He had taken his disciples there. And this particular story, this parable that we have, and these questions to Jesus actually happened after they entered the city triumphantly a day that we will celebrate on Palm Sunday at the beginning of next month. But now we find him in Jerusalem itself, and he is becoming more brash in his actions and his teachings, and he does not sugarcoat his parables any longer. The religious leaders see themselves in the parable about the wicked tenants, they see themselves as those tenants, and they see it as a trap. Because it's a trap for us not to see ourselves in it. The danger is saying this only applies to the Jews of the day, and not to see that we contribute ourselves to the injustices in the world. Our actions have consequences in our time and eternity. The Pharisees and the Herodians were incensed about what Jesus was teaching through this parable. They were incensed about how he was upending their religious traditions and their control over the people. In fact, they found themselves in the position of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The Pharisees and the Herodians did not like each other. They disagreed about most everything except about Jesus. 
both wanted Jesus eliminated. So these two who were enemies now became friends so that they could retain power, so that they could find common ground to work together and plot against Jesus. And they thought that they had devised the perfect trap, the perfect test, no matter how Jesus answers, they will have revealed him as a traitor to the faith. Should they pay taxes? The closer we get to April 15th, the more we hope ourselves that Jesus will just rebel against Rome and say, no, no, we don't have to pay taxes. You see, the Pharisees did not like Rome and wants Jesus to say that they don't have to pay taxes. And the Herodians were supporters of Rome, and they want Jesus to say yes to taxes and support Rome, which would have flown in the face of Jewish law. It would have been, it should have been, a beautiful trap. <laughs> Except they asked the wrong guy. They asked Jesus who does not think like we do, but instead Jesus sees things from God's perspective and comes up with a completely surprising answer. He says to them, whose portrait is on the coin, whose name is inscribed, is written on that coin. My husband, Alan, marks everything with Sharpies. I've talked about this before. I was always afraid he would put Smith across the forehead of our children just to mark them and know that they were ours. He marks towels because all our towels look the same. He marks socks. He marks his tools. And he marks to-go food. If we're bringing something home, it has to have somebody's name on it so it's not fair game in the refrigerator. He marks everything with a sharpie. Jesus says to them, whose name is on it? And they say, Caesar's. And he says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Jesus, you are brilliant. But in this answer, lies the trap and temptation for us if we don't remember whose we are. The instruction to give Caesar and to give God what is theirs can easily tempt us to compartmentalize our lives, faithful on Sundays, secular on weekdays. I'm sure like our home, you were flooded in these past several weeks with political mailers. Mailers that would sling mud at other candidates and who would just inundate us with information that was hard to process. I was in that world for more than a decade. I know how easy it is to, it is to be tempted to do certain things so that you can win an election because you know that you would be better than the other person, that you would bring your faith to that position. I know how easy it is to be tempted to separate yourself when you're dealing with the public, to make decisions that are expedient for all the wrong reasons, and to not allow our faith to influence our day-to-day -day lives. But when we are trapped, we need to remember whose we are. We need to remember that we bear the stamp of God, that we are made in the image of God. It was God's Spirit that pours over us in our baptism. We belong to God. We are not just gods on Sunday, but every day and every moment.
God's image is the one that is forever imprinted on our hearts. And so everything we do is a reflection of that image. God wrote his name in Sharpie on our hearts. We are claimed through Jesus Christ and we are called to give to God always. We will face temptations and struggles in everyday life. But now more than ever, we will face those temptations and struggles. We might see ways to cut corners and it might really be hard to live a gospel life this week. We will be experiencing things that are new to us. Not gathering with people, keeping distance. We might be tempted to live without God, to live a divided life. But in those temptations, I want you to stop. I want you to stop and remember that you belong to God. You bear his name. You have been made in God's image and will carry that forward always. So let us not be faithful just for today but for all days. Amen. Thank you for that uh, wonderful message this morning, Lisa. We would like to remind those who are participating live that you're invited to share your comments and prayer requests. We will be collecting as many as we can to share in our prayers of the community. We do have a few announcements this morning. We plan to have the church office open for regular hours, and Reverend Smith and Matt Moncrief can be contacted if you have needs or concerns. Due to isolation protocols, all gatherings over 10 people have been suspended through the end of March, including all mission and service events like Mercy House, Northeast of the Well and Home Groups. Any gatherings under 10 persons will follow social distancing recommendations. And there is no Mission Monday this month. Vanessa, may I interrupt? There, we are still planning for Relay for Life, though. So go to our website for that. So Relay for Life is still on the calendar, so please check our website for that. The Plan Town Hall for today has been postponed but we will be sharing information with the congregation about the restoration of the Fellowship Hall and the elevator project in upcoming emails. Due to school closures, we anticipate that some parents who are not working from home will be experiencing childcare challenges. If you can help with babysitting and childcare, or if you need this help, please contact the church office. While your gathering together is suspended, your faithful giving will continue to make a difference in the lives of those both near and far. Online giving is available at canyonhillspc.org slash give, or you may drop a contribution to the church during office hours. And now we're going to continue in worship with the prayers of the community. We have a few prayers this morning. First, for Judy Bailey, who continues to recover from the most recent infection. Also, Gary Knight, the coy son-in-law, recovering from thyroid surgery for cancer. Prayers for Chuck Collins, recovering from throat surgery to remove cancerous lymph nodes. His recovery is going well. Everett Fink, Linda Tubin's fiance, seeking treatment options from the City of Hope. We pray for those experiencing isolation due to quarantine or other limitations. Also, a dear friend of Jody O'Donnell from college, his name is Larry. He's battling cancer, cancer and the effects of radiation treatment. 
Also, from our live audience today, prayers for the sick. Many of those out there are already sick with just the normal seasonal flu and colds. So we pray for them. We pray for Tim Kinsman, who's recovering from a procedure. We pray for Jenna Kidd's aunt, who passed away, for her family, her cousins, and all that this affects. For Cherie Subramanian's friend, Lisa, who is having heart valve problems. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Holy One, you are our comfort and strength in time of crisis and chaos. Surround us now with your grace, dear Lord, and the peace that we, as the body of Christ, work through this most difficult time. Help us, Lord, to reach out to others who are fearful, who are ill, and who are isolated. Let us be a beacon of your love and an example of what it means to truly love our neighbor. By your spirit, let us lift up those who have fallen, sustain those who are working, and those who have fallen ill. Fill us with the hope of new creation, Father. Remind us daily, dear God, that you have ultimate control, and that your love for us will sustain us during this difficult time. Lord, we lift this prayer to you this morning that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
again, thank you all very much. Sorry we had to consult with the cameraman <laughs> what to do. Um, often in our, almost always in our services, we have a time to share the peace. And this might be a time where you are missing one another right now, mindful of those whom you sit near in worship. And so I would encourage you as a gesture of peace, I would encourage you to pick three people that come to mind for you today that you are missing and reach out to them before the end of today. Shoot out a text, an email, write a card, pick up the phone. Just reach out and share that peace with those who you are mindful of. I'd like to also encourage all of our congregants to be men and women of faith, those who belong to God, and in our demonstration of that, to be about daily prayer. This might be the perfect time to develop a daily prayer life if that is not something that is already part of who you are. So I would encourage you to set an alarm on your phone that will be reoccurring every day at a, an appropriate time for you, that you will be able to hear that alarm, you will stop what you are doing and spend a moment in prayer to God, sharing with God the things that you find challenging and the things that bring you hope and asking the Spirit to invade your soul and heart. And as we are sent out into the world, we are taught by Jesus to be a neighbor people. So following this broadcast, I would encourage you to go outside and pray for your neighborhood. Write notes to your neighbors and knock on their doors. See if there is something that they need. Share contact information. Be the Jesus people, the people of our neighborhoods, as we are sent out from not only this physical place, but where you are now worshiping. Following the benediction, I would love to invite Lee to play us out. Thank you. Like, uh, yes, I do love So. <laughs> so, friends, <laughs> continue the journey walking in love. Seek justice and make peace. God goes before you. Go with great dreams in your heart. Live boldly. Celebrate and sing. Amen.